that is very close to home to us, who's been a previous employee, uh, but now the assistant director of the Northwest ADA Center, Mel Toy. And she'll be on your left if you're looking from the computer. And then we have Jeanette Silva, who is a resume writer and also a job coach. And she has her own business called uh, J Silva, no, Silva Resume Services, excuse me. And she'll be talking after Mel about um, disclosing your disability in an interview and some other related, um, uh, you know, uh, job search related activities. So um, I will let them start the presentation and thank you for coming. My name is Mel Toy. I use she, her, hers pronouns. And like Lisa Wheeler said, I'm from the Northwest ADA Center and I'm very happy to be here to present to you all today on Title I of the Americans with Disabilities Act, ADA, and reasonable accommodations in the workplace. And I do have a PowerPoint that I'm hoping will be projected to everyone. More on that later. Next slide, please. Just a quick plug for the Northwest ADA Center. We are housed under University of Washington Center for Continuing Education, also called CSER. We have our main office in Mount Lake Terrace, Washington. We have employees and affiliates in Alaska, Idaho, and Oregon. Those are the four states that we serve. We're grant funded by the National Institute on Disability, Independent Living, and Rehabilitation Research, which we call NIDLR. We provide technical assistance, which is free to anyone who calls or emails us. And when we give information, uh, we are supposed to give information that's unbiased um, and pure information from ADA literature and what's been interpreted by the courts and so forth. So, Could you give us that phone number, please? In an employment you give situation, a number? phone number. I mean, oh, phone number. Uh, sure, I was going to go over that at the end, but I can give it out now. It is 800 949 4232. Okay, I'm going to interject just for a little bit. Uh, Sandra here from DSB in the back. If anybody has any questions, we will have a segment towards the end. We ask that you please keep yourself muted during the presentation because the speakers only have. 45 minutes to get their content out. So if everybody could please stay in mute. If you have any questions or if you have any sound issues, type it in the message box if you're on the computer and we will get to you. Thanks. Okay, thank you for that. So uh, going back to the technical assistance that we provide, it's supposed to be unbiased, objective information. So if in an employment situation, if an employee was to call us, with concerns about a situation they're facing in their job, we would give unbiased, uh, not legal advice to that person about where they stand with the ADA. And then if let's say a couple hours later, we were to receive a phone call from the employer in that situation, again, we would have to give unbiased, uh, not legal information to that employer. And your calls are confidential, so we wouldn't be able to say, oh, you're that employer we've heard so much about. Well, your employee just called us a couple of hours. We would not be allowed to, to do that. So your calls are confidential. Um, we give unbiased information. We don't give out legal advice, although we can re refer you to legal resources. And uh, we do not do any advocacy either. So sometimes people want us to come to their meetings at work. We can't do that, but we can refer the person to advocacy groups. We also do training, and that's an example of what I'm doing today. Uh, we create materials that take legal jargon about the ADA and try to put it into more plain talk with specific examples. And if you were to go to our website, you would find a web page called Fact Sheets, where we have multiple uh, documents there for anyone to read through, print out, distribute, um, disseminate out on um, the most popular uh, topics uh, and questions that we get at the center, including employment, service animals, parking, etc. We get a lot of questions about those topics. 
We do a research project, yep. and we also attend public awareness events. Oh, Could you give the phone this. number again, please? And I'll go over our contact information at the very end. I'll give out the phone number and our email address. And maybe we can leave that slide up for the rest of the time, too. Well, the reason I'm asking for the phone number at this time is because I'm on a cordless phone and the battery might not survive the full two hours. The phone number is 800-949-4232. 4232. Okay, thank you. All right, here is a slide showing a person in a wheelchair using a headset and looking at a laptop computer. And it is our disclaimer statement. The Northwest ADA Center is funded under a grant from the Administration for Community Living, ACL, an Idler grant. However, these contents do not necessarily represent the policy of the ACL, and you should not assume endorsement by the federal government. Now let's get into it. There are five titles of the ADA, Americans with Disabilities Act. Uh, title one is employment. Title II is public services, also called state and local government programs. Title III is public accommodation, which some people refer to as businesses that are open to the public. Title IV is telecommunication, and Title V is miscellaneous. Next slide, please. Title I is our focus for the next 40 minutes or so, and that has to do with employment. And we'll be answering the questions who enforces this title? Who's protected by it? Who must comply? What are the employee's responsibilities? What are the employer's responsibilities? What is the complaint process? And we have a photo of a person sitting in a wheelchair with a split uh, headset, looking at a computer, uh, sitting at an office desk. Next slide, please. So the question, who enforces Title I of the ADA? Does anyone have any guesses out there? People are pursuing employment Yes, next slide. That is correct. So the U.S. Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, also called the EEOC, enforces Title I of the ADA. The EEOC wrote Title I of the ADA, and they're the ones that enforce it. And we have a photograph of a person surrounded by flowers with uh, their hands up as if they were picking flowers. They're wearing a short sleeve shirt and um, dark tinted glasses. Next slide, please. All right, so who is protected? Under the ADA, there is a definition for a person with a disability. Um, and I think when the disability is obvious, if it's a sensory disability or physical disability, it's pretty clear that this individual is going to have protections under the ADA uh, and all the five titles that uh, I mentioned earlier. Where it's not clear is um, when a person has a condition and it's not, you're not sure, is that really a disability or not? So I've created two lists. And uh, the list uh, on the left uh, is a group of people. And if you'll just picture this group of people consists of someone who has a history of cancer, someone who has a cosmetic disfigurement, someone who has dyslexia, and someone who has a family member with a disability. So that's group number one. And in the second group, we have someone who's left-handed, someone who has a gambling compulsion, someone who cannot read because they dropped out of school, and someone who is using illegal drugs. So which of the two groups do you think has protections under Title I of the ADA? Group one. group one is correct. So if you hit next slide, we strike out the second group. So a history of an impairment could rise to uh, the definition under the ADA of a person with a disability who would have protections under Title I. A person who has a cosmetic disfigurement even if they don't have any functional limitations, day-to-day um, -day, uh, limitations based on their cosmetic disfigurement, they would still qualify as a person who has protections because of how they're perceived by the public and the discrimination they may face. A person who has dyslexia has a learning disability, so they could definitely be protected. 
And if you yourself do not have a disability, but you have a family member with a disability, you could be protected under the ADA because Think about if you go in for a job interview and it comes out that you have a kid with a disability, employers might say, I don't wanna hire this person because they might be gone all the time. So the ADA is to protect people in that situation. And then the column that's, strike, that's been stricken, uh, someone who's left-handed, that's considered a characteristic like being having red hair, um, someone who has a gambling compulsion, someone who cannot read because they dropped out of school is due to education not covered by the ADA. And illegal drug use is an interesting one. We get a lot of questions about this one. If you are actively using illegal drugs, you do not have protections under the ADA. However, if you decide to quit and you enroll yourself in a rehab treatment program and you're following your treatment care plan, then you have protections under the ADA. So as long as you're not actively using uh, if you have a history of illegal drug use, but you have stopped using drugs, you would be protected under the ADA. Next slide. So who are the covered entities of Title I? I have a list here. And one of these, um, one of these lines does not belong on this list. So can you figure out which one it is? Here's the list. Private employers with 15 or more employees. State and local governments employment agencies, labor unions, joint labor management committees, federal agencies. Which one does not belong in this list? Which one does not, uh, is not subject to the ADA? Any guesses? Labor unions. Okay, there was a guess for labor unions. Anyone else? Let's hit next slide. So it's federal agencies. They do not have to comply with the ADA. I'm hearing what? I'm hearing some murmurs from the crowd. Okay. So this is something that kind of surprises people. It surprised me too. Why don't federal agencies have to comply with the ADA? It's because federal agencies have to comply with an earlier law. It came out almost two decades before the ADA of 1990. And it's the Rehab Act. So federal agencies, they were scrutinized and and uh, had oversight to ensure that they were not that all their policies were non-discriminatory well before the ADA came out. So they were already under scrutiny before the ADA. So in fact, everyone else had to catch up in a matter of speaking with the federal agencies. So technically, federal agencies do not have to comply with the ADA. They have to comply with a different law called the Rehab Act, which is very, very similar to the ADA in a lot of ways. It's only a few little differences. So you're thinking that federal agencies, yeah, they better you know, practice non-discrimination in their employment practices. You're right on the money. It's just splitting hairs at this point. But technically, federal agencies do not have to comply with the ADA. And the rest in the list do. OK, let's go to the next slide. Here we have a picture of uh, people sitting at long uh, conference row tables. Uh, they're all looking the same direction, and there's a close-up of three individuals. One in the foreground is wearing dark tinted glasses and has their hands on a braille book and is smiling. Um, we'll talk about employee rights under the ADA in a general sense. There are four employee rights, and the first one, if you Great, the first one is request a reasonable accommodation. So employees have the right to request a reasonable accommodation when uh, they're an individual with disability. And the next one, they have protection from discrimination based on their disability in employment settings. And the next, freedom from harassment based on their disability in an employment setting. And the last one, protection from retaliation if they choose to exercise their rights under the ADA, so for example, if a person with a disability decides to make a request for a reasonable accommodation, they cannot be retaliated against in terms of termination or some type of penalty um, based on that. Okay, let's go to the next slide. So think about what is an example of a reasonable accommodation. If someone came to you and said, what's a reasonable accommodation? What springs to mind? Is it installing a ramp? How about 
modifying a restroom, providing a sign language interpreter for someone who is deaf, providing a reader for someone who is blind, providing written materials in alternative formats such as large print or braille, providing time off for someone who needs treatment for a disability. And the answer is all of those. The ADA recognizes all of those as examples of reasonable accommodation. The ADA does not give an exhaustive list of reasonable accommodations, but it does give a definition in a very broad sense. So let's look at the next slide. So according to the ADA, a definition of reasonable accommodation is any change or adjustment to a job, the work environment, or the way things usually are done that would allow a qualified individual with a disability to perform the essential functions of the job. And essential functions is underlined. And we have on this slide a picture of a person sitting in an office chair with their hands on a brailer and the person is turned slightly to look at the camera, they're wearing dark tinted glasses in their office. So the ADA is very broad in its definition of a reasonable accommodation. It gives the employer and the employee room to play with all the different options that could work for that individual. So it's not always about some very expensive piece of technology to accommodate the person. It could be something very low cost, like just changing a work schedule. Um, what's important here in this definition, which we'll talk about next, is the phrase essential functions, essential functions of the job. So we'll go to the next slide. What are essential job functions? These are the basic job duties that an employee must be able to perform with or without reasonable accommodation. It's the core set of duties or tasks. It's the reason the job exists in the first place. And it's going to depend on things like how frequently the task is performed or expected to be performed, how important that task is to the job, and how many people uh, in the work group can perform that task. It's not always clear what your essential job functions are. How, how have you ever received a list of your essential, these are the essential job functions. I've never gotten one, but uh, you get things like a job announcement <laughs> that hints at it. You get a job description that might, might be even more helpful, but it's really, really important um, when talking to your employer, when thinking about reasonable accommodation, what are the, the essential job functions? And if, you have a situation go down in your employment, um, in an employment practice with the EEOC is called to investigate. That's one of the questions they're gonna ask. What are, or what were the essential job functions? Next slide. So when can you ask for reasonable accommodation? Do you have to wait until you're employed? Do you have to wait until you've sort of proven yourself as an employee? When can you ask for a reasonable accommodation? So can you ask for one as you're trying to complete the job application? That's a pretty early on in the employment process. Can you ask for an accommodation then? What about if you're being scheduled for the job interview and in order to participate in the job interview, you feel like you need an accommodation. Yeah. Yeah. Can you ask for one then? I'm hearing some yeses. Yeah. Okay. How about once you've accepted the position? Yes. Yeah. Okay, so I'm hearing some yeses. How about after several years of employment. You've never asked for an accommodation. You're seven years into your job and you feel like now is the time to ask for a reasonable accommodation. Can you do that? No. Nope. I'm hearing a no. Yes. yes. Okay. So the answer is all of the above. So at any time in the employment process, a person with a disability can ask for a reasonable accommodation. So that includes application, interview, before you get the job, before you show up for work the first day, on your first day, on your 900th day on the job. You can ask for a reasonable accommodation at any time. Okay, let's go to the next slide. And that's because ADA applies to all aspects of employment. And here we have a photo of a person in a dark business suit and tie using a dog guide as they're traveling inside by a stack of uh, 
legal books, library. So the ADA applies to all aspects of employment. That includes job announce, uh, advertisements, job application procedures, hiring, firing, training, pay, promotion, benefits, and leave. It's just easier to say it applies to all aspects of employment from start to finish. Next slide. So the question becomes, how do you request a reasonable accommodation? You can request one verbally or in writing. And which one do you think we're gonna strongly suggest that you do? Writing. writing. So it's always good to have a track record, have things in black and white and have it in writing. So you can email uh, your employer or your supervisor um, the reasonable accommodation request. Well, that's what we would suggest that you do. Here's a myth. People think they have to use the words reasonable accommodation for it to be a reasonable accommodation. You don't have to say those words, um, but you do have to state your request in such a way that you let the employer know, this is not just something, you know, like a whim that I want this change to my work environment or to my work schedule, et cetera. This is something that I need based on um, a medical condition. This is something I need based on a disability. Now, having said that, you don't have to go into a lot of detail. You just have to let the employer know that this is an ADA type of request, as opposed to other requests that they receive from all the other employees that they have. So if you're asking for a desk that goes up and down so you can stand in your workstation, your coworker might have asked for the same desk, but your coworker doesn't have a disability. Employer's not going to know necessarily that you have a disability until they know, right? So you do have to somehow add that piece to your reasonable accommodation request. But you don't have to say, this is a reasonable accommodation request. You can if you want to, but you can phrase it however you want, as long as you add that medical piece to it. Um, and the last bullet on this slide, you don't have to disclose your disability, and that's true at any time during the employment process. There's a, uh, there was a photo on that slide of a, a person sitting down uh, using a, a braille note-taking device with a refreshable braille display. Okay, next slide. This is a big, this one we get questions on a lot. I just fielded a question on this yesterday. Can an employer ask me for a doctor's note? So I ask for a reasonable accommodation. I tie it to a medical need without giving away too much of my private sensitive information. And the employer's coming back at me and saying, I really need a doctor's note. Can they do this? The answer is yes. They can. They, you have the right to request a reasonable accommodation at any time during the employment process. The employer has a right to ask you for medical verification of the medical necessity only if your disability is not obvious. So if you're a person where you have an obvious disability, you're in a wheelchair, uh, it's obvious that you use an alternative communication strategy or device, uh, you are totally blind and that's obvious, then there's no need for an employer to go to your doctor to uh, verify that. It's if your disability is not obvious that they may need to do that. And they have the right to do that under that situation. Now the note can come from a licensed medical provider. Doesn't necessarily have to come from your doctor. Sometimes your doctor is not the best person to ask in right. some cases. Sometimes it's a nurse or maybe it's a rehab specialist or maybe it's your VR counselor is gonna be the best person. So the ADA allows for that. And it, the employer is not, um, the employer should not be requesting your whole medical file. They're not privy to that. Um, so it's not, oh, I need your complete medical history and all your prescribed medications. No, 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 no. Uh, it's only what's needed to substantiate the reasonable accommodation request. So a note from your doctor, medical provider, rehab, professional, et cetera, should only state the nature of your disability. It should not mention any specific diagnoses. It should mention the duration of the disability, if it's permanent or temporary, the severity 
and any specific tasks that are impacted by the disability or disabilities, which would warrant the accommodation. Okay, let's go to the next slide. Okay, so I really wanted to pull out the job interview phase of the employment process because we get a lot of questions about what what questions can be asked of me at a job interview what's illegal to ask at a job interview so i really wanted to make it clear um, that up until this point we've been talking about your rights and the procedure and so forth it pretty much applies to all areas of employment but now we're going to get into some specifics about the job interview phase itself so we'll go to the next slide so let's talk about questions that are off limits, legally off limits during the job application and interview stages. So this is what the ADA calls the pre-employment or pre-offer stage. But I'm going to call it the job application and job interview stage. And here we have a photo of a person dressed in a professional attire, holding a long white cane in a portfolio and shaking hands with someone across the table at a job fair. So the answer to this question, what's off limits during the job application and interview stages uh, is, employers cannot ask disability related questions before they make an offer of employment. Okay, next slide. So here are some specifics. And as I was looking these up, I was surprised. So um, as you hear these, um, kind of be thinking about what is the pattern here. I think that's helpful. And we'll compare this list of questions you cannot ask uh, a job applicant versus the next slide, which will show <coughs> questions that you can ask. And there's going to be some similarities, but also some differences. So on this slide, we have a photo of two people wearing business suits. Uh, the person on the left has a long white cane and is holding a briefcase. <coughs> Excuse me, and the person on the right is holding um, some papers, looking and smiling at the other person. So what cannot be asked before the job offer? The first one, how many days were you sick during your last job? Can't ask that. Not before you make the job offer anyway. So think about that one. How many days were you sick during your last job? Next question. What medications are you currently taking? Employers cannot ask that um, before a job offer is made. Next question. How often did you use illegal drugs in the past? <clears throat> okay, you can't ask that question, but remember that question. Remember that question for the next slide, hint, hint. Okay, the next question. You cannot ask, how much alcohol do you drink? Okay, you guys are laughing, but remember these questions because, um, well, just remember these questions because they'll, they'll come up again in the next slide. And then the last one on this list of what cannot be asked, do you have any physical or mental impairment that would keep you from performing the job you seek? So, it's, I think it's obvious to a lot of you in this room from what I'm hearing that yeah, you shouldn't be asking these questions. And why? It's because they're trying to elicit disability information about the person. And the ADA says you cannot do that before a job offer is made. Okay, so you all remember these questions because we're going to move on to the next slide. Here's where things get kind of interesting. So what can be asked? What legally can be asked before a job offer is made? So during the application, and interview stage, what can an employer ask you? And it would be legal, it would be legal for them to ask you these questions. The first one, are you able to perform the essential functions of the job you are seeking with or without accommodations? There, the, There's that phrase again, essential functions of the job. Okay, the next one, can you meet our attendance requirements? Okay, so they can ask you that. Next one. Next one is, how many days were you absent from your last job? Ooh, reminds me of one of the off limits questions from the previous slide. How many days were you sick from your last job? This one is similar, but what's, what's the difference here? How many days were you absent from your last job? Why is that one okay to ask? 
It doesn't mention sickness, right? You can't be sick, but you can't, you know, you can't be sick and you can be excellent. Like you can just slack off. <laughs> right. So employers can say, hey, I ask everybody how many days were they absent from their last job. I need to know about their attendance rating. And it, it, it doesn't have to do with disability, whether that's a part of it or not. So the ADA says, OK, you can ask that question. But as soon as they say, well, how many of those days did you take off because you were sick? Now we're entering into the off limits territory. OK, the next question that they can ask you. They can ask you, are you currently using illegal drugs? Whereas before they they couldn't ask you. How often did you use illegal drugs in the past that they couldn't ask you now? ADA says you can ask a person, are they currently using illegal drugs? This is a yes or no question rather than a quantitative question. And it's about illegal drug use today. OK, the next question that they can legally ask you, do you drink alcohol? Why would they ask that? <laughs> they can ask that. <clears throat> they couldn't ask you how much alcohol, but they can ask you the yes or no question, do you drink alcohol? To help them gauge if you're going to be the kind of employee they want to hire. <laughs> it's a big investment on their part, and they have to make a decision. And they have to ask questions to make that decision. And the ADA says, yes, employers should be allowed to ask questions to get at, is this person the right fit for our company? OK, another question that employers legally can ask an applicant is, have you ever been arrested for driving under the influence of alcohol? <clears throat> so pattern, definitely. Um, how often they're able to talk about sickness, absenteeism based on sickness, anything about impairment, off limits. When it comes to quanti quantifying and behaviors from the past, probably off limits. If it's a yes or no type question about your behaviors today, it may be OK legally for them to ask you that. And on this slide, we have uh, two people facing each other. Uh, the person in the uh, foreground is holding a piece of paper and the person in the background wearing a button down shirt and smiling. Next slide. Okay, here's a true or false question um, we get sometimes at the ADA Center people ask us. So they say, you know, I went in for the job interview and the employer asked me to demonstrate my ability to do X, Y, and Z. Can an employer ask me to demonstrate? True. Yes. So true or false? Uh, this, the question is true or false? Before a job offer, an employer can ask a job applicant to provide a demonstration or description of how they would perform a related, a, a, sorry, specific job related task. And the answer is yes. true. I think I heard it in this room. So the example that's given in the ADA literature is someone comes into the job interview and they're in a wheelchair. And the employer realizes this person's in a wheelchair. And they question if the person is going to be able to um, file these papers. That's going to be part of the job. That's going to be essential job function is we need the person who takes this job to be able to file these papers. So they're going to ask the job applicant who's using a wheelchair can you take these papers and file them in that bottom drawer? And legally, they can ask the applicant to do that. So can they ask a blind person, like, if, you, if you're applying for a job, if I'm applying for a job and I need to uh, go to different uh, places, can they ask me, can, you please, uh, can, can I see your ability to travel uh, to the restroom using the wiki? OK, so the question was, uh, can a job applicant, let's say they show up to a job interview with a long white cane, an employer thinks, okay, this is a person with a visual disability. I'm, I'm not sure if this person's going to be able to safely travel in our work environment. Can they ask the person to demonstrate their skills? What do you guys think? I think if you feel up to performing that demonstration or describing how you would perform that, go for it. If if instead you want to answer to the effect something like I would be able to perform the essential functions of this job I'm applying for with an accommodation, I think that would be a fine response too. Okay. So we're gonna shift gears now. It's really